Man, welcome to the show, man. Such an honor to have you on. Jimmy, man, it, it is great to be with you. And the craziest thing and why I'm excited to be with you is because for how many years were people like, you guys got to meet, you have to meet, you have to meet. We're in the same mastermind group. Couldn't even show up to the same mastermind meetings and we're in the same group. And then finally in Mexico, we get to link up and uh, it was special, man. So I, I'm really excited to be together. No, I think more than any other person I've ever heard about or been around like in their periphery, but we just had not connected. It was the weirdest thing. But, uh, you know, one thing I love about you, Ben, is you just have this energy, dude. And I, I, I believe that I, I'm the same way. And what's funny is people don't see that I have to reserve my energy when I'm not using it so that I can always show up because, you know, we really are going to make a difference in somebody's life based on how we show up in it. That's the only thing we can do. And so um, one thing that you do is you are obsessed about showing up the right way and showing up for yourself the right way. I want to start out. You said something in Mexico. I don't remember how many days in a row you've done some crazy workout, but uh, <laughs> how many days are you going on now, bro? Today was uh, 1,696. And what do you do for that workout every single day? It's, uh, and, and look, I say this very humbly. Uh, it's been, it's been a great run. I, I enjoy the workout. I, I'm going to just give you guys the honest answers because that's what Jimmy wants. I'm not saying anybody should do this. I know that I've got screws loose, but I'm going to give you all the, re all the real answers. It's a 45 minute workout. It's all body weight with the exception of one set of curls. But if I don't have weights that day, I'll just do an extra set of push ups. But you know, it's squats. It's wall sits it's jumping jacks but like four minutes and 44 seconds of jumping jacks straight planking for four minutes and 44 seconds straight reverse plank so all these unbroken exercises 10 of them it takes 45 minutes most people couldn't do it one time and we've done it all those days in a row and i don't say that to impress anybody but jimmy i believe in our work and one of the things i love about you it's the coaching it's the impact it's the passion that you show up with if we're not doing those things in our life, how, how are we going to talk to somebody about accountability and attacking their life if we're not doing it ourselves? Yeah. Now, I, well, and the consistency is the reason I wanted to mention that to start out the call, because, Ben, people think you're a success coach. You've, uh, you know, you've coached for the University of Alabama football, Kansas State football, some of the top companies around the country. You, I think we're named by USA Today as one of the top five mindset coaches in the entire country. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, it, that, that was that was. That was a really humbling one because, you know, the, there you're with your mentors. I mean, Tim Grover, Ed Milet, Brendan Burchard, Mel Robbins, people I've looked up to for years. That was that was wild recognition that I attribute to everybody that uh, supports and allows me to be a part of their life. Well, I, and I mentioned that so people can understand that, like you have been in the trenches for a very long time, multiple decades doing this work. And the one thing that I have noticed with all the successful people, and I want to get into a couple of the things that you've learned, you know, working with Alabama and Kansas State, some of these amazing coaches and things, but um, is that consistency is the only thing that wins over time. Like if you are consistent at what you're doing, whether it's a podcast, whether it's your workout every day, if you just absolutely just show up and do it, then you're going to have success and you're going to feel good. Your mind is going to be in the right place if you consistently do the right things every single day. Think of all the success that you had in real estate over the years, right? The massive, massive, massive success. And I want you to think about, and it's when, I, when I ask you this, I want everybody listening to think about it for them. Whatever walk of life you're in, whether it's real estate, whether it's mortgage, whether it's financial, whether it's sports related, whatever it is. Jimmy, how many times did you meet somebody where they're wildly successful and you talk to them and you're like, this gal makes $5 million a year. She can't put two sentences together. Oh, this guy makes all the time, $10 million right? <laughs> a year. He can't, like the guy can't speak a sentence. And then you have a conversation with him and you're like, oh my gosh, like this guy just does what he says he's going to do every day. And I think you nailed it. People are trying to find the perfect language, the perfect thing to say. I need to be just like Jimmy. It's like, no, you need to be the perfect version of your most disciplined self. And I think that's where people find that next level of success. Yeah, I one of the things I've tried to really emphasize in my coaching program is I don't have these like checklists of like, here's what you do to be successful. It's much more about, hey, what's going to work for you? How do you show up as the best version of you? What thing that if you do it every single day is going to move the needle the most in your life that's going to make the most drastic difference to have a better life, whether that's in your relationship, in physical fitness, whatever that you, you know might be for you. Because that's really the thing is like, there's no perfect way to do life. There's no one right way to do life. You pick a pattern 
um, you know, you, you choose a path and then you just be consistent towards making it better every single day. Um, and so, you know, that consistency and every person I've met that's because you mentioned the real estate, the one thing that I had to do every day was show up and do the thing. And I met some very unimpressive kids when they started <laughs> real estate. I'm telling but, you, but two, three years later, those kids that were consistent were rock stars. They were selling 40 deals a year. And you're just like, good for you, man. You know, when I got into stand up comedy, it was funny because the same thing I remember we'd have like open mic nights. And I remember this one guy, he was horrible. He was so bad, but he would write jokes for six or eight hours every day. And guess what? I wasn't writing jokes at all. I was just, you know, depending upon the ones I now, I was in school and I had a full-time job and a company and everything else. But at the end of the day, I was not being consistent at writing jokes every day. One of the things that Seinfeld says, he says, it takes me about 40 hours to come up with a minute of good material. So I just have to be consistent and sit down and write jokes every day. No matter what, I got to sit down and do the thing. And long story short, uh, I remember about a year went by and this dude, you know, we were all much better than he got up and he slayed it. And I was like, oh my gosh, what the hell just happened? This dude's funny now. And he became a top, you know, national touring comedian. But it was just doing the thing. But here's the problem that people have been is they're not willing to suck. People aren't willing to get on that stage like that did, dude, where all of us are laughing at how horrible he is because he was bad. And these agents that come into the office and they can't get out of their own way in real estate for the first couple of months. But if you're willing to suck long enough, you're going to get really good. So I, I I don't know if I have ever, ever on a podcast talked about this. And I don't even know if I want to tell you the name of the show because people are going to go and try to Google the old episodes. I hope we shut them down. But to your point, I've been doing this for 18 years, right? That's a that's a long time. A lot of people, they're just getting it. Like I've been coaching and speaking for 18 years. First time I ever got paid to speak was 2006. Well, the first time we had a show, now our podcast is called The Burn. But I had an old show. I'm not even going to name the name of it. It was every Monday I'd come on. Jimmy, when I see videos of that, I'm like, dude, how did I make it out of that period of time doing this? If people saw that now, they'd say, what in the world? But I was doing it. I was building the muscle. I was figuring out ways to get better. I was thinking about the things maybe that didn't work. And I was just getting in reps. And you know what? Back then, people did follow and it did grow. And I was coaching and I was speaking. But even you fast forward to today, Jimmy, I still feel like I'm not done. I've got two coaches. I'm reading books every day. You and I share some of the same mentors. You and I are in the same mastermind. Like, I still want to get better. Well, it's one of the things that Ed said the other day at my my, my event that he spoke at. He, you know, he, he goes, there's a little trick, you guys. It's just freaking idiots all the way to the top. Like, nobody knows what they're <laughs> doing. Like, we really don't. But there's just an honor in just putting it out there and doing the thing, you know, and, and and putting yourself out there. I have a buddy who's an amazing coach. He's a one-on-one -on -one coach. He's got about 20 clients. I was talking to him the other day and he said, dude, I'm kind of mad at myself because I haven't been sharing on my social media what I do. And it's like, I'm doing a disservice. Like I need to be putting myself out there more. And he started putting some videos out and he got some kickback. He got some, you know, some people didn't like the way he was doing it. And I think it was what, you know, kept him from pushing and keep doing that. And I told him, I said, dude, you've got to be willing to just let people laugh at you a little bit. Like you don't have to be great. Like everything you put out, isn't going to be a banger. You know, if you're that worried about it, you're just never going to do anything. And I have another friend who's just starting. He wants to really build his personal brand and he's brilliant. He's, he's, as far as business goes, he's much better and smarter than I am. And he's getting zero traction right now. And I just kept encouraging him. I'm like, bro, keep going. Just keep doing it. Like four likes, it doesn't matter. 12 videos, you know, there's the famous video for Mr. Beast when he first put his videos out and you can see how bad he was. You know, Jen Gottlieb talks about, you know, her journey where how bad she was. It's pretty much every person yeah. that got really good at this was really terrible. I look back at some of my old videos and I'm like, oh my gosh, who let me do this? Like somebody tackle that kid, you know, but I didn't know any better. I was just doing it. And I'm sure people were just like, this is funny. What the hell is Jimmy doing? You know, but over time, you, you actually learn a few things along the way. And those are the things with, I would encourage everybody, have the right mentors and coaches on your journey. I, I remember in 2008, I was doing a public event. I'm a St. Louis born kid here in St. Louis. John Gordon is another one of my mentors, led me to Christ, amazing human being, one of the best speakers in the world today. And we do our first event together ever. He'd already been mentoring me. So picture this, he's in the back of the room, never heard me speak live. I get done. And Jimmy, you're like ready to go to the back of the room. Like, this is your mentor. Like, man, how did I do? 
And he's like, man, he's like, you're a great communicator. But he's like, uh, got to be honest with you. Like, it's okay. You're allowed to smile on the stage. You know, you can laugh. And if you want to, you could even tell a joke. He's like, why don't you actually have some fun? Stop being so damn intense. And now I found my natural blend is I am a little goofy. I am a little, little funny. I love to laugh, smile, but I do have that intensity. And now I just want to be myself and get better being myself. But I needed those words from him because you have the wrong mentor and coach if they're always just smacking you on the back, telling you how great you are. Yeah, well, in your defense, you were probably spending too much time around Saban, where this is a pretty serious guy. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. How did you get that gig with Alabama? It's the greatest football dynasty probably we've ever seen. You know, the time, and for part of that time, you were at Alabama as part of their mindset coach. Um, what did you learn being around Saban, and how did that even come about? Yeah, so I'll take you back to how it happened, because I think we all have to choose to be courageous. We all have great, crazy ideas, but if you don't act on them, then the amazing chapters of your story might not happen. And so there was a press conference after a national championship that Saban won. And one of the reporters said, Coach Saban, when are you going to start planning for next year? And he said, tonight. And the reporter says, tonight. Like, Coach Saban, what do you mean tonight? Like, you just won the national championship. And essentially he said, I don't think you understand me. When I do something, I'll do it better than anybody else. If I were a street sweeper, there'd be a sign out in front of my house that says the best street sweeper in the world lives right here. So you hear this press conference. About a year later, I pick up the phone. I have this crazy idea. I call my friends, the Duvers, John Duver, Joe Duver, Destiny Connolly. They own a place called Vinyl Images here in St. Louis. I call Joe. I say, Joe, I need a street sign. He says, I'll do anything for you, brother. What kind of a street sign do you want? I said, I need it to say the best street sweeper in the world lives right here with a cute little street sweeper truck, and it needs to be big, orange, and obnoxious, a street sign. He's like, all right, I'll make your sign. Give me a couple weeks. He goes, who is this for? I said, it's for Coach Saban. He's like, dude, have you lost your mind? And I said, no. I said, I I know what I'm doing. I need you to make this street sign. We're going to send it. Long story short, I send Coach Saban this street sign. You cannot send Nick Saban a letter. The guy gets thousands of letters a day. You have to send something that gets his attention where he goes, what the hell is in that box? That sign hung in his office for three years. I basically became a pen pal with him. We'd send letters. I'd send him books that I'd written. I didn't get an interview, Jimmy, until 2017. I sent the damn street sign in 2014. It took three years just to get the interview. I started saying I'd get the job in 2012. I ended up working for Coach Saban. I was on his payroll for five years. I didn't show up and give one talk at Alabama. I probably had 75 visits. Some of those players are close, dear friends of mine today. They come to the house, have dinner with the family, jerseys on the wall. I still help them in the NFL. I was a mental conditioning coach for Alabama for five years, two national championships. And what I learned is that it was all about the relationships and it was all about expectations. From the first day that I ever walked into the Malmore Athletic Complex at Alabama, you walk in there in Tuscaloosa, Jimmy, you could feel it. The expectation, you could cut it with a knife. And then when you meet Coach Saban, you just realize everybody in that building, there's a standard, there's an expectation, and you attack every detail of what you do, or you're going to get your ass thrown out of that building. Well, I want to touch on that two standards, because that's the name of your book, Um uh, talk a, l- a little bit because I think people misunderstand what it means to have a habit versus a standard versus a goal, and they're very different. And I've always said, you know, when we're stressed or when we're tired or whatever else, we don't go to our goals; we fall to our standards. So whatever your standard is is where you're going to end up. Yeah, I, I sat in Coach Saban's office when he interviewed me for the first time to determine whether or not I'd really get the opportunity. Thank goodness the first talk, I actually got tested before he gave me any of his time. I spoke to the players, spoke to the team, spoke to the coaches, attended some lifts, but I didn't get any time with him one-on-one. Then I kind of passed that first test. The guys enjoyed the talk. I go into his office. He says, Ben, you know, where where do you think we go from here? What are the things that are going to resonate? I said, coach, I said, with the expectations that you've set and the standard you've set here, I think it comes down to, and it's something I had been saying for years and I've been teaching for years and coaching for years standard over feelings. It's exactly what you just said. Don't allow your feelings to dictate how you show up. It's about attacking the standard every day. So of course the goal is to win a national championship. Of course we know what the habits are, but you have to attack that standard because otherwise 
you'll fall short of your habits. You're, you'll fall short of the goal because you have a really good game and then you stop living to the standard. So it's about attacking the standard, whether you win or whether you lose. And that's where you really find the separator. And that's why I believe I was able to stay there for five years because I said something to him in a way that was directly in alignment with his belief system, what he'd been teaching, how he built his foundation. But I said it differently than he'd ever heard it. So he knew he could trust me to walk in there and make a difference with his players. So one question I think, I think everybody would love to raise their standards. Um, and I think there's just sheer, you know, putting in the work and doing it. But how, how do you help somebody to just um, to up their standards? Well, first off, you have, you have to go back and identify the period of time when you've been most successful, right? Every, everybody listening, whether you're literally in the hottest streak of your life and you feel like it's been going on for three years, whether it lasted three weeks and it was second quarter last year, whether it was two months ago, I think you have to isolate the period of time when you've been most successful. And then you have to reverse engineer and say, what were the things I was doing during that period of time when I was most successful, right? What were the standards? How did I think? How did I behave? Was I listening to my self-talk? And then you have to identify what those standards are. And those standards might become, I don't listen to my self-talk. You may hear it, but I don't listen to it. You may say, I don't show up late. I show up early and I'm prepared to execute in every opportunity. You may say, my standard is, think about Ed Milet, the power of one more. In everything I do, I will do one more. Well, what does that guarantee? Psychologically, Ed Milet, has created a way that he guarantees himself to do what he knows he needs to do because you can't do the extra one until you've done what's required of you. So I've always called the extra one the unrequired. That becomes a standard. So if Jimmy Rex says, I want to speak on more stages, I want to coach more people, I want to have this event or that event, well, then you know what? You have to do what you say you're going to do every day. But then the standard is that little bit extra that guarantees that you do what you say you're going to do every day in everything that you do. And what you find, and I know this with all the high performers you work with, Jimmy, so I'd love to hear your opinion on what I'm sharing, is that those highest performers, this is not for everybody. There are some people right now that go, okay, this guy's veins popping out of his neck. He's just gone to a level of crazy. Like, does this guy actually enjoy his life? And it's like, yes, I do. Because part of my standard is taking my kids to school in the morning going and watching my kids' basketball games and working my ass off. My son's basketball game is at 4.30 today. I will be there at 4 for warm-ups. I don't show up at 4.45 and I show up late. I'm there at 4.34. So that means I get everything done in the period of time in which I have. I don't decide to not do what I'm going to do. And so you have to decide to do it regardless of the circumstance. Yeah, no, I mean, I totally agree. And I, I, I've been saying this for a while. I was like, excellence isn't for everybody. It's honestly not. Like, if you're not willing to do certain things or sacrifice certain things, because you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And you really do got to determine, all right, what is important to me? So it's not like you set a standard for every single thing in your life, but you set a standard for what matters, for what's important, for the things that you don't compromise on. And then you just live up to that standard. Um, I think for a lot of people, you know, there's a motivation issue. There's a, there's a, there's, they don't have a big enough why or whatever that might look like. So for the person that can't motivate themselves, Ben, to live up to a standard or to even set a high standard, how do you raise the bar for them? Well, I think those individuals have to really determine, understand, and connect to what I call their burn. And there's a lot of coaches that talk about why and they talk about purpose which is so unbelievably important. But until somebody identifies and understands their burn, I don't believe they'll ever reach their highest level of potential and continual peak performance. And so my burn... Okay, oh, let by me the way, I want to, I want to, before you get into your burn, yeah. I want you to explain, because that's the name of your podcast. That's your whole thing really is the burn. Maybe get into that first and explain what it is before you talk about your personal burn. Yeah, so I was going to, that kind of teaches it, but I can certainly do that. So the burn is the underlying fire that actually ignites your why and purpose. And that's what causes you to show up on the days that you don't feel like it, and especially after you win, right? So how many of you, you wake up and you say, I don't really feel like it. I'm just going to stay in the warm and cozy sheets, right? So the why and purpose is not actually preventing you from hitting the snooze button. So we have to identify the burn because the burn piece is the part where you say, I will not waste a day. So for many of you, 
You may say, you know what? My entire life, somebody told me I wasn't big enough. I wasn't strong enough. You can't do it. You don't have what it takes. And you were told that you're not good enough. Well, that's different than your why and purpose. If you've ever had a period of time where you were really successful, you say the reason why I was successful is because they told me I could never play running back in high school. They told me I would never be big enough. Think of Deuce Vaughn, who I've had the blessing of working with at Kansas State University, is now the smallest drafted running back ever. That is one of the most disciplined, lived to the standard, amazing kids I've ever met in my entire life. That kid was always told you'll never be. So what does he need to think about? He just, that alarm clock goes off and you've got somebody, he almost sees these eyes going, you're not big enough, you're not strong enough, you could never do this. And that lights a fire in him that says, just watch me. Just watch me go attack this day. So let me ask you a question about that because I, uh, when I was 14 years old, my father, he wanted me to get held back in school a year to be a star athlete. He thought if I got held back here, he knew some other guys that had done this at a, a rival school and became the state MVPs in baseball, won the state championship. And I wasn't that good of a baseball player, if I'm being honest. I was like the eight hole hitter on a really good team, you know? And he thought, well, if I, you know, if Jimmy gets held back a year, then he will thrive and maybe be, you know, a star player, get a college scholarship, the whole thing. And he put a lot of pressure on me, like offered me money and you know, pay for a truck, all these things. And I told him no eventually. And uh, under a lot of pressure at 14 years old, you have to decide that year because mm-hmm. once you start your clock in ninth grade, you can't do it. And he looked at me in the eyes and God bless him. He was just trying to give me, you know, the best he, he knew. Uh, he was trying to help as much as he knew how, but he said, you know, okay, well, just so you know, you'll never play baseball again. And he said, you're not good enough. And all I heard was, you're not good enough. And so I wrote it on my hat. I wrote, you're not good enough underneath my hat to motivate me my entire high school, right? And I became a great high school baseball player. But what happened is it motivated me subconsciously. I mean, now knowing the power of words and affirmations and all things, I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do to myself? But I was always trying to prove myself. And it did benefit me in a lot of ways, right? I became the best, uh, you know, real estate agent, number one in the, in the whole state at one point. I became the best missionary, you know, most baptisms ever and all these. But the happiness of it or the fulfillment of it was a little bit fleeting because I was always trying to prove that I was enough. And mm-hmm. it, it wasn't until about five years ago, I had this beautiful experience where I saw my hat for the first time in 17, 18 years. And I realized, oh. Like, oh, oh my gosh, what have I done to myself? You know, and um, and this like voice came to me, and it basically said, "This is what was cool." And I'm going to get to why I'm telling this whole story, but it said, "Jimmy, this has served you. It no longer does. It's time to let it go." And it didn't say it never served you. It served me. It was my burn, right? But I guess my question is, is like, how healthy is it to call on that burn if it comes from a place of? not feeling like you're enough or being too small or, or being insignificant or just not being loved or whatever, you know, being told you're never going to make it. And, and, you know, you hear Michael Jordan. I mean, the guy's like in his sixties and he's literally the best to ever do it. And he's still bitter about it. Like how much of the fulfillment was missed because this guy just called on that burn so much. And maybe you have to, to be that great. I don't know. I guess that's my question. Well, you know, I, I think there's a, a, there's a dark place. There's a hap. Everybody's different. And I think if you would go to Michael Jordan, he'd probably say he wouldn't change a thing. You know, if I were to say to you, hey, Jimmy, would you want to take your dad? Would you want your dad to take those words back? Or are you I, glad he said those words? I would not take it back. But I right because I can now look with hindsight to the result. Right. And even the parts of that that screwed me up were it screwed me up in dating and, and just ego and some things like that. But I've worked hard to rewire those things. Right. But you're right. And, I and my take it back and my father used to say terrible, awful things to me. And I never felt that I was good enough and I could never be good enough. And so that was part of it for me too, that became this double-edged sword that beyond losing my mom 11 days before my eighth birthday to teach me to understand the appreciation of every single day, I did have a dad who then once he moved back into the house, nothing was ever good enough. And so you and I, we know what that's like, but I wouldn't change it because it, it made me so strong. And so if we understand that nobody's ever going to be perfect, you and I could say, well, that was a detriment to me. Well, if there's never been anybody who's ever been perfect, well, if it's not this, I'm going to deal with something else. So then we could always go down this rabbit hole of self-talk that says, well, this because of this, because of this, did I not have fulfillment here? But if we're never going to be perfect, we have to accept the challenges and figure out how can we become strong from our pain? How do we allow it to give us perspective? And those are the things that I've always looked for. You turned it into strength. I turned it into strength. 
Some people look and say, hey, my mom and dad had to have three jobs just for me to have opportunity. I won't waste that sacrifice. And that becomes the burn. Or somebody says, hey, there are these little eyes that are watching me in my house. And I know I'm an example for those little eyes. I can't waste a day because I'm making sacrifice for them right now. And they're watching how I show up. So the burn comes in many, many different ways. And everybody's story is different. But I think you got to step into it. You got to lean in, into it and you got to attack it. Yeah, no, I, and I appreciate that answer. I'd, I've thought many times, well, the, the beauty of the way that I received the message even was, hey, this has served you. It no longer does. It was like, oh, damn. Like, and that, that was so, so beautiful, you know? And so, gosh, this, you and I could talk for hours about this. When my dad died in November of 2021, Jimmy, I went my whole life. I was a grown-ass man seeking my father's approval at 43 years old. Like, what the hell was I doing? I wish I would have stopped trying that years ago. Now, I wouldn't change it. But I don't want somebody listening to make the mistake of holding on too long, right? Because now I can share with you the fact that his voice is gone. I don't listen to it. I don't seek his approval. There were some amazing things that Ed Milet has done in my life. There were some amazing things that Dr. Gabrielle Lyon has done in my life. And the two of them, coupled with the love and support for my family, since my dad died, Jimmy, it has been like this rocket ship where I feel like not, I go through a lot of shit, there's challenges and growth, but man, not like letting that go has been so important. And then now the only burn that remains is that burn of living every day to honor my mom. And so I think there's some that are forever. And then there's some, like you said, you just got to let them go. Yeah, no, uh, well, it's David Dita talks about this in the way the superior man about like, if you're always trying to get your father's approval. Like if you haven't read that book, you should read it. There's a specific part about that. That's very pivotal. It's, it's very, it can be very detrimental and hold people back. Like you said, unfortunately he had to pass away for you to get to that next level because you were seeking his approval. It reminds me of the movie. If you ever seen Talladega nights, when he's like finally reunites with his dad and he's like, dad, you told me I became the best because you told me if you're not first, you're last. And the dad goes, that's just dumb. I must have been drunk or something. He's like, you could take second, you could take third, you could take fourth, you could even take fifth. <laughs> like he lived his whole <laughs> life off this thing to like try to, you know, this dad. And it was like all bullshit, you know. But anyway, it just kind of makes me off because sometimes I think we do hang on to things. I remember in, when I was in real estate, I was the number one agent in our office for like five or six years in a row. And, you know, one year I, I went to, I just did a lot of other projects and things. I didn't take it as serious. And um, this other real estate team passed me. And they had like nine realtors. We had like three. So it was like, I didn't even care. Like, I didn't even know we were in a competition, but he like, it was their big goal. And they was like, their whole burn was to beat me out. And I remember after they did, and it was like, he came over and he was so excited. And he's like, we did it. We beat you. And I just looked at him. I was honest to God. And I just go, I didn't even know we were competing, bro. But congratulations. Like his whole <laughs> thing was just like so important to him. And it was, but it was cool. Cause like, you know, that's an example of a burn though. And you do have to find those things, you know, you have to find the reason that you're going to push past. Cause if you only do stuff when it's convenient, if only do it when it feels good, you're just not going to accomplish anything. I mean, you have to be willing when you absolutely know part of you wants to get up and do it, you got to get up and do it. Otherwise, you you become seduced by success. You know, we're talking about the, you know, person who's, hey, I'm having difficulty winning. There's also the other side of it. If you guys listen to what I said, I said, you do it on the days that you don't want to do it, but especially after you win. Jimmy, how many high performers, when they start doing coaching work with you, do they come in and they're making a lot of money? They're already making seven figures, but they don't realize you could be at eight figures. Heck, with your business and your model, you could have a nine-figure business, but they've settled for where they are because when they have big victories, they stop doing the things that caused them to have victories. So they never understand what real momentum in their business looks like because they stop it every time that they're winning. So that's the power of the burn is when you're connected to it, you're not wasting any days. It doesn't matter if you made a million dollars yesterday, you made $50,000 yesterday, you had the biggest sale of your life yesterday. You wake up that next day, and when you think of that burn, you don't hit the snooze button. You know what discipline and standards are in your life, and you attack them regardless of what did or didn't happen the day before. And that, to me, is the power of continual peak performance, which is where I love helping people unleash the power in them. Yeah, that's 
something that you do so well is you take people that are already having massive success and get them to the next level. Um, I like to ask this question to other coaches because I think that, you know, you have been able to been, be around so many high successful people, high um, performers. What really are the things that make them different or make them stand out, Ben? I think people, you know, there's, we talked about consistency, which is, I think is the most important thing, but, um, and maybe it's the burn is the other one, you know, having that, that deep burning desire inside of you that just says, I'm going to win because I can't not win. It's, this won't even allow me to be settled in myself if we don't. What else have you seen that top performers do differently than the rest? Well, I, I think there's just the discipline. There's the there's the resilience, which typically comes from the burn. The burn causes them to be resilient and to get up one more time than you've been knocked down. There's tremendous discipline. You know, the self-talk is very limited, but then there's standards and there's things that they learn that they just repeat over and over and over again because they know that that's how they're going to win more. So I, from a football standpoint, Jimmy, I've gotten so lucky. I mean, the, the two head coaches that I spent the most time with are the two winningest coaches over the last 15 years in college football. Coach Chris Kleiman at Kansas State and Nick Saban. I mean, we won nas multiple national championships. I won three with Coach Kleiman at North Dakota State, then we go to Kansas State, and then everybody knows Saban's resume. And Coach Saban, two of my favorite lessons, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. That wasn't a quote for the week. That was like, that's how Coach Saban lived every day. And then Coach Saban would say, we don't do things until we get them right. We do things until we can't get them wrong, right? So there were, there were things that he identified that this is the way we operate. So that didn't have to change. That's the way they always did it. Come to me to with come with me to Kansas State, and I know you don't want to do that because now we battle in the same conference against your teams. Oh, I'm but, in, buddy. <laughs> but at Kansas State, we say, or I shouldn't say, we say, we now say because of Coach Kleiman's leadership, find your edge in the details. And so what Coach Kleiman encourages us all to do, like if you have a responsibility, so if my responsibility is mental conditioning for the team. I have to understand every detail. What's Jimmy's edge? What's Jimmy's burn? That's my responsibility. If we're talking about our offensive lineman, that offensive lineman, you better go find your edge in the details to not have focus, but to have intentional focus because you watched game film of the man you're going to line up across from, and you know if he puts his hand in the dirt, he's expecting a pass play. So if you're running a running play, you're going to pancake that son of a gun, right? Like you're going to nail the guy. But you saw it, you know it, because you were prepared because of the details. And I know I'm getting into the details with this answer, but I hope you guys understand I'm doing that for a reason, because that's the power of the details. Because when you hear an explanation, you're like, I never thought of it that way. I thought the player just lines up and goes, Jimmy's across from me, let me try to punch him in the mouth. No, there's things that you're looking for because you already saw it, and then the game slows down for you, and then that's how you win football games. So – each person, you find their individual burn in, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it, and then you press on that to motivate them. Is, is that kind of your coaching style? I, I, it's beautiful, but like, I guess, does everybody know their burn or is part of being a good coach helping them find that and helping them tap into that? So it's a combination of both. Let me give you a sports example. Let me give you a business example. So Coach Saban would always, first talk I would always give to the team would be on the burn and what I call your prize fighter days. That's how we would break down our days. For them to take ownership, everybody knows what they need to do. Players would design, here's what I need to do every day in these categories. When I do them, that's how I win. Then he'd have me talk about the burn. First talk I would always give, new rookie class comes in, I'm in front of them giving that talk. So one of the players three years ago, I give the talk on the burn, similar to the conversation we're having. He comes up when I'm done, right before we go out to practice. He says, man, can I tell you my burn? Right? So I had empowered him. He, come, he wants to tell me. Yeah. He says, my little sister died when she was one. She never had a chance to live. And I now, I, I realize with what God gave me, I can change my family's life forever. And it's why I wear the number one. Jimmy, I go out to practice that day. Who's the first kid that I see? Of course, it's the way God works. I walk into the indoor. There he is. Now he's dressed for practice wearing the number one. I walk up to him. I put my arm around him and I said, I will never look at your jersey the same way ever again. That young man is getting ready to get drafted into the first round of this year's NFL draft. He'll have enough guaranteed money. His family will never have to work or do anything for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And so that burn, because he understands it, right? That's a sports example. 
I had somebody who did not have clarity. Business example, probably, I don't know, seven, eight, 10 years ago now, I go down working with financial advisors, high level firm down in Orlando. Guy says, man, I don't know what my burn is. There's no sacrifice, no pain. I've never gone through anything like I didn't lose my mom the way you did. I said, fine. I said, I don't like the monetary examples, but like, what's something that you're looking forward to doing or building or having for your family? He said, man, I want to build my wife's dream home. We've been talking about it. We're getting ready to start it. But he's like, when I say that, like, I'm talking about like every knob in the kitchen on the drawers and like, I want everything to be exactly the way that my wife wants to have it. I said, well, that's your burn. I said, imagine every day you wake up and you say, I cannot waste a day because every knob has to be with my, we can't get the cheap knobs, right? We can't get the cheap faucets. I want my wife to have everything she wants. So about a year later, I'm back at that same firm. He's like, man, I, my burn. He's like, I don't feel motivated anymore. Jimmy, I looked at him. I said, your house is beautiful. He goes, what? I said, your house is beautiful. He goes, what are you talking about? Oh, I said, I saw the pictures on Facebook like four months ago. You moved into the house. Gorgeous. I said, it's the dream house. He goes, it is. I said, well, that's the problem. I said, you moved into the burn four months ago. We need to figure out and recalibrate what the burn is. And so, Jimmy, I hope that gives a little more context. This can come in so many different ways. Well, it does. And for me, you know, it was interesting when I, you know, had that realization about my hat and kind of healed that wound. It was pretty tough to motivate myself for about a year because it, it used mm. to be so easy. I would just like I could just tap into that pain and it was like, let's go. You know, it was like, I didn't even have to do it consciously. It was just always there. Um, I will say, like, you know, redefining what was going to be my burn kind of came through. I had some really beautiful experiences and it's kind of what led me to what I'm doing now to having the men's group is I watched, you know, I had this one experience where one of my friends essentially called one of my other friends into integrity to help save his family and some things like that. And he only knew what to say to that friend because he'd been to the depths of hell in his own relationship and had to get it fixed. And it was just this moment where I was like, it became my new bird. I'm realizing like, it was like this moment where I said, I, I have to bring this to the world. Like I, I was like, I couldn't not do it once that experience happened. And then, you know, I had these other things that I could rely upon and it's why it became so passionate about my own. I can still get emotional when I talk about some of these experiences from four or five years ago. I do a keynote speech about when I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and, you know, talk about a burn, um, you know, uh, there was a guy that was climbing with us. His name's Phil or Q is what we called him. And he had one leg. It had a leg get blown off in Iraq. We had this amazing group. You can appreciate this. I mean, we had Jason Kelsey with us, Chris Long, Haloti Nada. I mean, the who's oh, who of the yeah. NFL? Like, yeah, uh, Rob Ninkovich. Um, and then we had these military guys that were special forces. And one of them is a guy named Dave Vabora, who essentially started this place called the Adaptive Training Foundation in Dallas. And they help military guys that have lost limbs to find purpose through climbing mountains or wakeboarding or skiing, things like that. And they train him. And so he had been training this guy Q to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And when I got there, you know, I knew I wasn't going to fail climbing that mountain. Then like, I was just, I wouldn't have gone if I didn't think I was going to do it, but I didn't have the strongest bird. I really wanted to be there to hang out with the football players and kind of get to know them, you know, <laughs> if I'm being honest. And uh, the first day I'm having breakfast with Q and I talk about this in my new book, Be One, that comes out April 2nd. Um, I tell this story because it's such a, it, it's my burn came so fast, so furious to get up that mountain. And what happened is we're having breakfast and I actually chose to have breakfast with him because he was this really shy guy. Everybody else was, I was still kind of intimidated a little. And we're having breakfast and he talked about, you know, he got blown up in a tank in Iraq and that's why he lost his leg. And he's like, I want to get to the top of this mountain because 22 military guys take their lives every single day. And I want to prove to them that they have a life worth living for. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, okay, we got a bigger purpose of going here. And that burn like started, it was like, okay, that's a better burn. And all of a sudden I'm like, damn, let's get Q to the top. But the first day we're on the mountain, I'm walking next to Dave Vabora, the guy that trained him, 6'4", you know, middle linebacker, the whole thing. And this dude is a beast. And I'm talking to him, I said, dude, it's so cool that you, uh, you know, you trained Q. He told me that he's doing this because 22 military guys take their lives every day. And he says, Jimmy, I got to tell you this story, man. It's a little deeper than that. He said twice in the last six months, Q's had a gun in his mouth and I got the call from his wife to save his life. He said, this dude's been battling this for the last several years. There's been multiple you know, attempts. He said, if he doesn't get to the top of this mountain, I truly think he'll be dead in six months. He said, if he gets to the top, I think he'll overcome this and, and he'll be able to thrive. 
And I'm like, oh my gosh. So all of a sudden my bird to get to the top of this mountain went from like, this is cool to there is no way on God's good world <laughs> we're not getting Q to the top. And Ooh. I will get into the rest of the story. But there was a moment when we got to the fault summit of Kilimanjaro. You're about 600 feet from the top, but you have about an hour to go on the rim and you're in altitude. So it's a really treacherous time on the mountain. And long story short, the guys in charge were trying to get Q to go down. They basically were saying like, hey, man, you've given everything. It's time to go down. And I was freaking out because I'm like, no, 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 he can't go down. He can't go down. You know, but we were multiple. I mean, we'd been hiking for 10 hours that day. He'd fallen down 50 times. He was bleeding. He was done. He'd given everything he had. And I found Dave. I'm like, do something about this. And he came over and he grabbed him. He's like, damn it, Q, you're not done. We're going to the top. He turned to the guys in charge. He said, he's going to the top. We'll carry his ass if we have to. And we ended up getting to the top. It was this most beautiful moment of my life. But my point is, is like, there was no way because the burn was strong. And so sometimes the burn can be a very quick burn. It can be a temporary burn. It can be something that was just for that week. I didn't, I wasn't calling on that motivation after that, but there was no way they would have had to have dragged my dead ass off that mountain before I didn't get to the top with Q. That my friend is why I knew you and I would be lifelong friends when we met. And for everybody listening, even though Jimmy's supposed to be interviewing me, this is going to make me emotional because this is why I love what I do. And so here we are, we're having a coaching moment for Jimmy, is you had a burn that you needed to get rid of. You now, you don't have to have a coaching business for money. You don't need to throw events for money. You don't need, but what you just shared was in a moment's time, the moment you figured out what motivated somebody else, that's the sign of a real coach and a leader. That moment that you knew, this guy's going to kill himself. You said, I will sacrifice everything in me. What matters for me no longer matters. I'm going to go serve. That's why more people were baptized because of you. That's why it was real estate, because it was every transaction or every baptism or now every man that says, I need you. I have to be part of your men's group, Jimmy. I have to be part of it. Brother, That that is a, just your just to serve every day, to surrender and serve. I mean, that I, I hope everybody heard what I heard like that. I mean, that that's that's what makes you special. And I, I knew that because, look, you and I speak at enough events. We go to enough events. We meet enough coaches. It's like my bullshit meter is like fast. Like I know it. Like this guy is full of it and he's doing it for the wrong reason. Dude, that, that was special. Thank no, you. Thank you, Ben. Well, yeah, no, it's, you know, I, I always tell people like, if nothing else, like, you know, when you start coming from a servant, it's just a fun way to live. Like, honestly, it's actually selfish because I just love being able to feel good when I do good for other people or, or help other people, you know, overcome those hurdles or do those things. And so it's kind of this weird way of being selfish, but it's just a really fun way to live your own life. So I don't know how else to say that, but Ben, we could talk all day, my friend, um, for people that want to learn more about you, they want to see uh, more of what you're doing. Where is the best place to send them? The website is bennewman.net and then at continued fight is social media and look forward to staying connected and for everybody to continue on the, their path and their journey to understand the power of their burn. I mean, look what, look what Jimmy just said. Look at the different burns that he shared from his life. It's powerful and I want the same for you. And many of you already know it, but stay connected to it and just keep stacking days. Love it, brother. Thanks again. Thanks man. for I look having forward me, to brother. connecting some more soon.